Well, hello everybody and welcome to the February meeting of the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. It's great to be with you again and we have a pretty interesting evening scheduled here. So I'm gonna ask you all to just sit back and relax and imagine yourself in Peyton Hall on the Princeton campus and think about astronomy for the next couple of hours. To get us a little bit in the mood for astronomy, I'm just showing you a star map of what's up tonight. If it were clear after our session tonight, you could go out the back door and have a look up in the sky and see something like this. Of course, you're not gonna see all those red and blue dots up there, but what I'm showing you is just some common asterisms. You can see the Milky Way, sorry, you can, you can see the Milky Way running down the front from, from north to south across the ecliptic here. You can see some common uh, features like the Big Dipper here. You can see Orion down here. If I just move it down a little bit more, maybe a way that those of us who are using the star charting programs a little bit easier to see your way around. And just to point out a couple of features, you know, as we're heading into late winter, the constellation Leo is coming up and has some splendid Messier objects, M66 and 65 and so forth that we do like to show through the telescopes. And also up here near the uh, Big Dipper, M81, M82, uh, Bodhi's Nebula, M81, the famous uh, astronomer from way back in the 1700s first discovered that galaxy. And our, our laser pointer, our green laser pointer that Jen bought us for out at the observatory is shining right at the object NGC 2403, which is crossing the meridian in about 1030 tonight. And I show you this, I pointed out because it's a very beautiful object to do astrophotography with. And I succeeded in getting this image actually in the last couple of weeks, about two weeks ago when we had the clear nights after the first snowstorm, after the first 10 inches and before the second five inches, I actually got the roof open and was out there for tiger. This is about five hours of exposure with my 12 inch uh, re reflector. And this uh, spiral galaxy is part of the Messier M81 group um, about 8 million light years away. And what I wanted to call your attention to it, it has numerous star forming H2 regions. We've talked about these in the past, but these are the regions of dense gas where stars are forming. They tend to glow red because of the ionization of the hydrogen. Now it doesn't come out quite so well from our New Jersey light polluted skies, but still you can see some reddish tinted spotted regions throughout this galaxy. Well, an example of what those really are here in our own Milky Way galaxy, this is one of the famous ones, NGC 281, sometimes called the Pac-Man Nebula, is one of these H2 regions that we were looking at in the prior galaxy. And this is what they look like when they're in our own galaxy, now about 9,000 light years distance. And you can see some of the features, which is astonishing to me to see this kind of detail coming up. Again, this is about a five hour exposure right here from my backyard in Titusville, right in the middle of all this light polluted uh, New Jersey skies. So this is by way of saying that we have an active astro video group in the club. Uh, you know who you are. And if you haven't joined our sessions, um, you're absolutely welcome. All members are welcome to join these. And we're going to have another go at it this Friday evening. Um, I don't think the weather's looking very promising once again, but still affords us an opportunity to get together for maybe 45 or 60 minutes and chat about astronomy techniques and telescopes and video cameras and, and so forth. So uh, that Zoom link will be sent out later this week. So feel free to join us. Even if we cannot show you the sky's splendors, we'll, we'll talk hardware and software and have a kind of a geeky evening of it, if you will. So with that, I think I've said enough. I'm going to turn it over now to Victor, who is our program chair. And Victor has uh, everything he needs to introduce our new speaker uh, for tonight. I am <laughs> pleased to welcome our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Gudmundur Kerry Stephenson. And he'll speak on searching for new worlds with next generation astronomical instruments. Uh, exoplanet science has been an ex has seen an explosion in activity since the discovery of the first planets outside our solar system in the 1990s. We now know of over 4,000 exoplanets and that rocky planets are prevalent in the galaxy. So is it just a matter of time when we detect uh, Earth 2.0? 
Um, in this talk, Dr. Stephenson will discuss new and exciting discoveries in exoplanet science, and in particular, his ongoing research on developing and using next generation technologies to better detect and characterize exoplanets orbiting nearby stars. The main science goal of these new instruments is to better detect rocky planets orbiting in the habitable zone, uh, the region around the star where liquid water could be sustained on the surface of the planet. Dr. Stephenson will end with a look to the future discussing what exciting possible science results await with upcoming and future ground and space-based observatories. So a little bit about our speaker, Dr. Gudmundur Stephenson is a Henry Norris Russell Fellow at Princeton University. His research focuses on developing and using next generation instruments to better detect and characterize planets outside our solar system. Dr. Stephenson received his PhD in astronomy and astrophysics at the Pennsylvania State University in 2019 as a Fulbright and NASA Earth and Space Science Fellow. As part of his PhD research, he led the development of a new technique employing engineered diffusers, low-cost nanofabricated optical devices capable of molding the focal plane image of a star into a stabilized top hat shape, capable of delivering space quality photometric observations of transiting exoplanets from the ground. Dr. Stephenson contributed to the design, construction, and commissioning of two next generation planet finding spectrographs, the Habitable Zone Planet Finder and the NOID Radial Velocity Instrument, I knew I was gonna mangle that, Dest designed from the bottom up to detect terrestrial planets orbiting in the habitable zone of nearby stars. So Dr. Stephenson, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. Thank you all uh, for uh, being here. And thank you so much again, Victor, for the kind introduction. Really excited to, to be here and talk a little bit about exoplanets and then about my research sort of in general, but in broad strokes, like um, Victor mentioned, then my research focuses on in broad strokes to develop and uh, use uh, next generation technologies to better detect uh, exoplanets uh, from the ground. So then, yeah, let's just dive right in. At the beginning of the talk, I wanted to show you one of my favorite places. A few years ago, a couple of friends and I, we did, we hiked the John Muir Trail in California. This is a um, hiking trail that starts in the magnificent uh, Yosemite Valley in the uh, Sierras in California and ends about 200 miles uh, south uh, on top of Mount Whitney uh, at about 14,500 feet. After hiking for a number of days, uh, we sort of reached uh, the second to last day uh, of our journey and we pitched our tents just before um, reaching the summit of uh, Mount Whitney and we were treated with this magnificent night sky, um, one of the best night skies that I've ever seen. This is one of those night skies that sort of really keeps you up at night, sort of wondering what your place in the universe uh, is and actually it did uh, keep us uh, up uh, for the night where we were taking photos and time lapses of, of the Milky Way as it sort of scanned across the night sky. And as we sort of look at this figure, I want to show you one number. This is four uh, with a number of zeros behind it or 400 billion. Does anyone want to guess what this number might mean in this context? Number of stars in the galaxy? <laughs> exactly, yeah. These are the approximate number of stars in the Milky Way. And I'll let that sink in a tiny bit. So it doesn't take long until we start to wonder, okay, there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. And do any of these stars have planets like uh, in our solar system? What do they look like? Are any of them similar to the Earth? And could any of them potentially support life? These are some really exciting and fundamental questions that sort of shake us to our core of who we are sort of as thinking beings. And also very excitingly form sort of the basis uh, of exoplanetary science in many ways. 
And we live at very exciting times when we're starting to make real progress on answering some of these, these questions. So what is an exoplanet? Well, the definition is simple. It's then just a planet outside our solar system. And since the discovery of the first exoplanet in the 1990s, this field has just absolutely exploded. We now know of over 4,000 exoplanets uh, to be exact. Then the number is 4,341 when I checked it yesterday. And this number just increases day by day. Exoplanets come in all shapes and sizes. There are these rocky terrestrial magma worlds that, uh, that are super hot. We would feel like standing right next to the exhaust of a rocket engine. And then there are these further far away gas giant worlds. I really like showing uh, this figure over here which sort of attempts to um, demonstrate what the diversity of uh, exoplanets, uh, of known exoplanets uh, is. And, but I will note that uh, this is an artist illustration. We don't, as of yet, we don't have the required resolving power to actually see the surfaces of the planets just quite yet, but it's gonna be very exciting in the coming uh, years and decades as we start to improve our instruments to, to further um, sort of examine what the, the, the surfaces of these exoplanets uh, might look like. One of the very exciting sort of realizations uh, and results in exoplanetary science in recent years is that terrestrial exoplanets, then these little guys uh, over here are frequent and they're frequent around a certain type of star in particular. And those stars are uh, so-called the red dwarf uh, stars. And in this slide then I'm comparing on the left, uh, sun-like stars and on the right, a red dwarf. Red dwarf stars are then uh, stars that are substantially smaller than uh, the sun. Uh, they have a mass of about 10% to 50% of the mass of uh, the sun. And these stars are also much, much dimmer uh, than the sun. And they actually emit most of their light at near infrared uh, wavelengths. Whereas sun-like stars emit most of their light at visible uh, wavelengths. And because of this, we, can actually, we, we can't actually see a single red dwarf in the night sky uh, with our naked eyes because uh, the eyes aren't really sensitive to uh, near infrared light, but um, they are very numerous uh, in, in, in the Milky Way. And red dwarf stars have a number of different favorable properties to detect and um, characterize exoplanets orbiting around them. And I want to walk you through a few of them now. So number one, uh, red dwarf stars are numerous. They are the most numerous types of stars in the galaxy, but about 70% of the stars in the Milky Way are red dwarfs. And to highlight that, I like showing you this video over here, which sort of shows a nominal uh, part of the night sky um, with uh, observed in the optical. All of these white points here are then stars observed in the optical. Uh, with a number of sort of black patches uh, in, in between. But then what would happen if we were to observe it uh, with a telescope that is sensitive uh, in, in the near infrared? Then the black patches just sort of light up uh, with light uh, uh, where a number of these points are then uh, red dwarf stars. So there's a lot of red dwarf stars around. The second reason why uh, these red dwarf stars are excellent targets for um, detecting and characterizing planets is that because they're so numerous, they're also our nearest stellar neighbors. And to highlight that, I'd like to show you this video uh, over here, which um, from the Recons team, which sort of uh, walks us through uh, what are the most nearby stellar system to the sun. Uh, in the middle, uh, the yellow, big yellow dot is then the sun. And what we're doing is we're starting to zoom out um, from the sun, uh, where we are counting up in parsecs. Uh, one parsec is then about uh, 3.2 light years. And now we have reached a distance of about 1.5 parsecs, and we're starting to see uh, the most nearby uh, stellar system, the Alpha Centauri and Proxima Centauri system. Now we're getting even further, and we're starting to see a number of red dots. Red dots here are then red dwarf stars. Yellow dots are sun-like stars and white and blue dots are stars that are much hotter than the sun. 
now we have reached about 10 parsecs and what you're starting to see there is a lot of points actually and um, on most of these points are red signifying that most of these um, stellar systems are red dwarfs and now we've reached the 25 parsec limit uh, about 80 light years and which then includes then within this radius there's about 2100 uh, stellar systems or so and what we're going to go through now is uh, to walk us through sort of what are the different evolutionary states of uh, these stars in the stellar neighborhood. There are about 105 giant stars. These are then evolved uh, stars that have started to poof up. There are about 137 white dwarf stars, which is sort of uh, the uh, latest or last chapter in, in the life of uh, the sun, which the sun will experience in, in the future. But then there are no neutron stars and no black holes within this radius. And now what we're uh, what is walking us through is the different sort of spectral types. Um, this is then effectively uh, just sort of uh, how many hot stars are here in the top. Uh, o, B, A, and F stars are hot stars, and then the G, K, and M stars are then the cooler stars, where the the biggest fraction of, of these stars are then these M dwarf stars. And excitingly, the most nearby star, Proxima Centauri, is a red dwarf star. And just a few years ago, uh, it was announced uh, that Proxima Centauri has a rocky planet orbiting in the so-called habitable zone around the star. So what is the habitable zone? The habitable zone is then the region around the star where liquid water could be sustained on the surface of the planet. Now we're zooming in uh, to the, um, the Proxima B system with uh, Proxima uh, Centauri, the star uh, in the middle with uh, Proxima B orbiting around it. In the habitable zone, the habitable zone is then uh, this green region here uh, where liquid water could potentially um, be on the surface of, of um, the planet. The orbital period of Proxima B is only on the order of 11.2 days. So very short, substantially shorter than anything seen in our solar system. And this is because then uh, the host star is so dim and this causes the habitable zone to be very close to its host star, uh, allowing uh, then liquid water to be in liquid form and not completely frozen. Um, uh, so it needs to be very close to actually allow it to be in liquid form. And then it's exciting to sort of wonder what uh, the surface of this terrestrial planet might actually look like. Are there potentially oceans? Does it have clouds? And this would probably be if we uh, ever become uh, then interstellar uh, faring civilization, this would probably be the first uh, stop uh, in our visit, um, um, visiting the different stellar systems. Here's just another figure of uh, sort of illustrating the habitable zone and the habitable zone is then uh, this region in green over here where uh, liquid water could be sustained on the surface of the planet. It's then not too hot, um, uh, not too cold, but just right to allow uh, water to be in liquid form on the surface of the planet. And another uh, planetary system that I'm very excited to tell you about is the TRAPPIST-1 system that maybe some of you have uh, heard about, but uh, this is a very exciting system that was announced just a few years ago. Um, this is also a, a very low mass uh, star, TRAPPIST-1 even lower mass than, than Proxima Centauri. TRAPPIST-1 is actually has a mass that is only on the order of 9% of uh, the mass of the sun. And it has, um, it's about the same size as Jupiter. So this is a star that is about the size of a, a giant planet. Uh, this system actually has um, seven known planets orbiting around it. And all of this, uh, the, the planets are similar in size to, to the Earth. Here I'm showing the TRAPPIST-1 system, uh, showing uh, the seven planets, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H uh, over here. And we're comparing it here in the top to the size of uh, the Jupiter and its major moons, uh, Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. But the TRAPPIST-1 system is actually so compact that it's actually about the same size uh, as the Jupiter and its major moon system. And 
we're also comparing it here to the actually the, the size of the uh, our inner solar system and because the trappist one system is so compact it would easily fit well within the orbit of mercury the orbital period of uh, planet h which is the uh, outermost uh, known planet in the TRAPPIST-1 system is only on the order of 20 days or so, whereas the orbital period of Mercury is on the order of 80 days. And excitingly, three of the planets um, in the TRAPPIST-1 system are in the habitable zone, then planets E, F, and G. So then it's also uh, exciting to wonder uh, if there could be maybe frozen rivers, um, these uh, ocean banks and if we were to stand on the the uh, its solid surface it would actually be very easy to uh, see the uh, surfaces of the other uh, planets um, from um, standing on the surface of, of, of one of the the planets here because they're all orbiting so so close together And TRAPPIST-1 is also very uh, nearby. And then if we continue to imagine uh, sort of uh, what the future might actually look like if we start to travel between uh, these different worlds is maybe TRAPPIST-1E like this. Uh, I really like this poster from, um, uh, from the NASA suite of uh, posters uh, uh, highlighting sort of the TRAPPIST-1E might be uh, chosen as a uh, best uh, habitable zone vacation spot uh, in, in the future. So. Okay, those were some of the, the, the main things that I wanted to mention and highlight in the beginning of the talk. And then here's a sort of quick outline of what I wanted to talk about next. Um, next, I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, two of the main discovery methods that we use to detect and characterize exoplanets. Uh, these are uh, the two detection methods that um, have resulted in the most exoplanet detections uh, to date and are also the uh, detection methods that I use in my research. And then um, at the uh, latter halves of uh, the talk, I wanted to um, talk about uh, our instrumentation development in developing new uh, technologies to better improve uh, on these detection techniques to sort of improve um, our precisions to sort of where we're really starting to try and push towards detecting uh, Earth-like planets around, uh, around these stars. And in the end, we'll uh, discuss about some exciting future uh, exoplanetary science missions that are coming up. So at this point, are there any questions? There was one question that came in through chat. Um, is mm -hmm. Proxima B tidally locked? That is a great question. I most uh, likely think that it is because it uh, has a short, uh, short uh, orbital period, uh, but I don't completely remember off the top of my head, but I most uh, likely think it is because it has a very short orbital period and that's exactly when they sort of, they tend to um, be tidally locked. That's a great question. And that has also some implications about um, habitability and those types of things, because then you're always um, illuminating the same, um, the same surface of the planet and, and things like that, which has implications for, for habitability. Okay. I'd say we could continue. Great. So yeah, let's just dive right into the discovery methods. So one of the main ways that we use to detect and characterize exoplanets is the Doppler radio velocity method. And this method then relies on measuring the minuscule uh, shifts in uh, spectra that we observe of, of stars. Here I'm showing an example spectra, spectrum with um, absorption lines uh, shown here in the black. And then as a planet orbits around its host star, it actually causes the host star itself to orbit in, in its own tiny orbit around the common center of mass of the system. And then by taking repeated, very precise measurements of the spectra of um, uh, the star, then we can see if the spectra are shifting around and then infer the existence of a planet. And how much the spectrum is shifting around is related to the, the mass of the, of the planet. And to calibrate everyone on the precisions involved when trying to make these measurements, then the, the wobble or sort of the speed of the, uh, the sun due to the earth is on the order of 10 centimeters per second. So then when we try and make these measurements, uh, when we try and detect uh, then Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, then um, 
then we're trying to make measurements of these far away distant stars that are uh, moving at the approximate speed of a desert tortoise. So these uh, observations are, are quite challenging to, to do, especially at these precision levels. And this was exactly uh, the uh, detection technique that was used to detect the first exoplanet around the Sun-like star. And just a couple of years ago, in 2019, Michel Mayor and Didier Coelho, uh, they um, got the Nobel Prize uh, for their uh, discovery of uh, 51 Pegasi b, which is then the first uh, exoplanet uh, discovered around a, a Sun-like star. Then I also want to mention the other half of the uh, Nobel Prize that same uh, year was awarded to Jim Peebles. Uh, but if we were uh, at um, in normal circumstances, then we would be in, in Peyton Hall uh, um, uh, giving this lecture. But Jim Peebles, he is a frequent visitor uh, to Peyton Hall, uh, having his office uh, just in the physics building uh, right next to, to Peyton Hall. Uh, and he uh, received half of the, the Nobel Prize that year for his fundamental contributions to, to improve our understanding of the evolution of the universe. But if we go then back to, circle back to the exoplanets, then the planet that uh, Michel and Didier discovered is called 51 Pegasi. Uh, this is a very bright star uh, in the constellation of uh, Pegasus. And uh, you can actually see a 51 uh, Pegasi from, uh, and it's observable from uh, Princeton in the summer. Uh, you might need um, uh, binoculars or, or, or your telescopes to, to see it. And this is what the data looked like that they published in their nature paper in 1995. So here, this is showing the velocity. This is then the shift of the spectrum on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is uh, the orbital phase. So you can think about this as sort of uh, time where we have sort of phased it up into um, uh, up of the sinusoidal signal over here uh, with the period of the periodicity of the signal. So the immediate next thing, uh, thing that you see over here that the amplitude of the signal is on the order of 50 meters per second. This is 500 times larger than the 10 centimeter uh, per second um, precision or the amplitude of um, the Doppler wobble of the sun due to the earth. So this planet is really large. This is a Jupiter mass uh, planet or so that has a very short orbital period of around 4.2 days. So this planet is, um, and, and other planets like it uh, are called hot Jupiter uh, for this reason these are very massive planets that orbit very close to their host stars. And these are their, these extremely highly irradiated uh, worlds. Um, this was actually, um, there's a reason why um, uh, these types of uh, planets were detected first, because these have these very large signals uh, with the Doppler radio velocity method. And uh, since the discovery of the first uh, exoplanet, uh, these um, many more similar hot Jupiters were detected. But still, even to this day, the formation or sort of evolution of these types of um, hot Jupiters still actually remain a puzzle in the field. Of how do you get uh, these types of very big uh, planets that are orbiting so close? This is completely different that, uh, uh, than anything that we see in our solar system. There are all these ideas about um, that it's difficult to form and get all of this gas to compress and, um, and coalesce uh, with uh, so close to, to the host star that maybe the, the, the um, planet actually formed much further out and then it actually traveled or migrated uh, closer in with time, uh, arriving at these very short older periods as we see them in now. But as they then migrate in, then any other planetary systems that might be on their way, they might be in deep trouble <laughs> because they could then be ejected out or be, or um, hurled into the star or uh, have a collision with the, the migrating big Jupiter that is um, sort of um, hurtling towards, towards the star. Okay, so that was the Doppler method. And then the other method that uh, we use a lot in, in our research group is the transit uh, method. This method then relies on measuring the minuscule dip in flux uh, as a planet crosses in front of the stellar disk which I'm showing uh, here with this video. But then uh, as a planet crosses in front of the stellar disk, it blocks a minuscule fraction of the 
the stellar light. And if we then take uh, repeated measurements of the brightness of the star as a function of time, then we can see a dip in the brightness over here. And the depth of this dip is then uh, related to the, the, size of the size of the planet. Now, these two methods actually work really nicely together. Um, we can get a handle on the radius of the planet from the transit method. And from the Doppler radio velocity method, then we get a, can get a handle on the mass. And together, then uh, this, we can calculate the sort of bulk density of the planet. And then we can start to answer very exciting questions about, is this planet a gas giant? Or is it something terrestrial and could potentially be something similar to the Earth? Okay, those were sort of the main things on the discovery methods. And then over the last few years, then we have been uh, working on developing uh, and using the next generation technologies to, to improve on both of these techniques. And then I want to talk to you a little bit uh, first about um, uh, our development efforts to develop new uh, spectrographs for uh, the National Science Foundation and NASA. And then um, after that, I'll talk a little bit about uh, these new exciting devices called engineered diffusers. And so the two spectrographs that we have been working on over the last uh, few years, I'm showing over here, uh, the Habitable Zone Planet Finder or HPF on the left and the NUID instrument uh, that we're just finishing uh, installing and commissioning actually on the three and a half meter wind telescope at Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona. HPF uh, we installed in late 2017 on the 10 meter Hobby Eberly telescope in Texas. Usually how we get there is that we uh, fly uh, from uh, the, the East Coast to um, El Paso and then we drive for three hours straight into, into the mountains, uh, reaching then uh, reaching McDonald, the remote McDonald Observatory uh, there. And um, to get to Kitt Peak, Observatory, then we usually fly to Tucson and then drive uh, one, one and a half hours um, to reach uh, the mountains of uh, where Kid Peak Observatory is. The main science goal of HPF is to detect terrestrial uh, rocky planets uh, orbiting in the habitable zones around uh, nearby red dwarfs. Uh, whereas we've designed uh, NUID from the bottom up uh, to focus more on detecting terrestrial planets around sun like stars. And from these uh, sort of overarching science goals, then uh, the whole design of the instrument sort of flows down uh, from these uh, uh, exciting goals. And then we design HPF uh, to be a primarily uh, near infrared instrument, then making uh, use of the, um, the fact that, that uh, red dwarfs emit most of the light at near infrared wavelengths. And then uh, NUID actually has a very broad uh, wavelength coverage, uh, primarily uh, observing though in, in the optical. And with HPF, then we have sort of a goal radio velocity uh, precision uh, of about one meter per second, which is sort of the required uh, radio velocity precision to uh, detect and characterize a rocky planets orbiting in the habitable zones around uh, these red dwarfs. But for NUID, then we're actually even more ambitious where we're uh, are hoping to get around 30 centimeter per second radio velocity precision or so. Um, we are more ambitious uh, here because the sort of the quality of the, uh, the technology in, in the optical is, is, is much better. Uh, the detectors in the optical are much better than in the near infrared. And uh, there are a number of, of things that are uh, sort of improved and easier to do uh, observing in, in the optical. Uh, we also, of course, have the ultimate goal to try and get as close as we can to 10 centimeters per second, uh, which is sort of really the, the precision uh, levels needed to uh, detect true Earth twins. Okay, if we, if we step back and sort of think about what, uh, if we, we're talking about these 10 centimeters per second uh, radio velocity precisions, and then what does that actually entail in terms of technology? Um, so, to make these types of measurements, then I like uh, showing you this figure. So this is uh, a surface electron microscopy image uh, of a silicon CCD detector. The individual dots, white dots over here are individual silicon atoms. 
And then when we try and um, make measurements that are on the order of 10 centimeters per second, this is then equivalent of trying to measure spectral shifts that are only on the order of a few silicon atoms across. We can also say that another way, it's about one six thousand uh, of a um, detector pixel. So these are extremely small shifts that we're trying to measure. Uh, we actually haven't uh, obtained these types of precision levels just quite yet. Uh, we are um, the current best sort of precisions in, in the field are so, sort of on the order of 30 to 50 centimeters per second. Uh, we have just been sort of um, where we have just been sort of starting to acquire those in, in the very uh, recent years and months. And then, so it's when you're designing an instrument to try and um, uh, make these types of measurements, it's extremely important that the spectrograph uh, that you design is very stable. So any sort of temperature or pressure variations uh, can easily cause the instrument to buckle or, or temperature uh, variations can uh, cause the optical um, mounts to expand and contract, which can um, uh, shift your spectrum around, which can then masquerade as, as um, which can hide our, uh, the signals that we're very, that we're uh, intrinsically interested in the, the shifts um, of a star due to a planet. We don't want any of the instrumental uh, effects. So then in our designs for HPF and NUID, then we have designed uh, both of these instruments to be extremely stable and here is an exploded view sort of of uh, what uh, the HPF instrument looks like, uh, showing all of the optics are then in inside here on an optical bench inside a thermal shield uh, shown here in blue. And um, because HPF is operating in the near infrared, we actually have to cool down the instrument to around 180 Kelvin or so. This is to uh, suppress the thermal background uh, irradiation that we would otherwise get. Otherwise, if we were operating at um, room temperature, then we would just be completely swamped uh, with um, background light from the hot optics and, and, and things like that. So we cool everything down. Uh, to do that, we use a big liquid nitrogen tank, which is down here at the bottom. And then we um, hook up the thermal shield over here with these copper straps to cool down the, the thermal shield. Uh, and then we have uh, these heater, stop sign looking heater signs over here which we use to actively control the temperature of the thermal shield at the millikelvin level long term. This is then really to make sure that everything within uh, the, the thermal shield uh, remains extremely stable in temperature. And then we have all of the, uh, the, the optics and the thermal shield enclosed in a uh, high quality stainless steel uh, cryogenic vacuum chamber. This is then to minimize any sort of uh, pressure fluctuations and, and things like that. Here are some photos from the field. Uh, this is then um, showing when we were working on uh, fabricating and building uh, the, the instrument. Uh, this is then the thermal shield after we have actually um, folded it up in these multi-layer insulation blankets, making it look like a nicely wrapped uh, burrito. <laughs> and um, uh, these multi-layer insulation blankets uh, we built in house. And uh, so we spent actually a considerable amount of uh, time sewing uh, them together and um, learning from the best uh, practices. Uh, you can also actually uh, use uh, these um, tag guns, uh, the same sort of tags that uh, are used to hold uh, price tags uh, to clothes when you buy them at the store. We actually use those a lot to hold uh, the different uh, layers of the, uh, these blankets together. That saved us actually a lot of time. And so this is then the thermal shield uh, enclosed in the multi-layer insulation blankets. This is the same technology actually that is used to uh, thermally uh, insulate um, spacecraft uh, from the cold um, uh, space ambient environment. Um, and we can use the same technology here because we actually have all of the optics in a vacuum in the, the vacuum chamber, which is here in the back. And some of us are here for, uh, for size. This is actually a photo showing uh, when we're examining the heart of the instrument. This is the so-called shell grating. Uh, the shell grating is, is really the heart of the instrument because this is our main dispersive element uh, of the, the instrument. This is um, 
about uh, one meter, about three feet or so long. Um, uh, the, the substrate is very thick, made out of uh, extremely stable glass ceramic called um, Cerador because the coefficient of thermal expansion is almost exactly zero. And then um, it actually has over here on top of it, a protective cover. And then below the protective cover is a very delicate um, then surface, a gold coated surface with uh, these carefully uh, ruled diamond um, grooves, which were uh, ruled with a, a very precise uh, diamond ruler uh, to give uh, grooves that uh, are capable of dispersing the light into uh, the different wavelength bins, allowing us to, to get the spectrum. And here are some photos also from the lab uh, showing uh, some of us uh, posing in front of the, um, the HPF camera. And here on the right, uh, this is actually what was taken uh, at uh, our uh, clean room lab at Penn State. Uh, when we had an exciting time when we were actually working on both instruments at the same time, HPF here in the front and then uh, the new spectrograph uh, at, uh, at the end. Uh, so we do most of this uh, work uh, then in clean rooms to make sure that we don't uh, contaminate any of the optics with any sort of particles or anything like that that would be um, detrimental to the, to the optical quality of the system. And so we started working on uh, HPF in particular, uh, almost exactly when I started my PhD at uh, Penn State in 2013. Uh, we had then uh, sort of many of the key design elements had been uh, finished uh, then and we had just sort of started uh, cutting metal. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the lab and in the machine shop over the next uh, few years, uh, making sure that everything uh, worked and um, uh, as it should. And then after a few years of um, assembling everything and making sure that everything worked, then we uh, packed everything up uh, and shipped it halfway across uh, the US down to um, the observatory, McDonald's Observatory in Texas. And this is a, then a time-lapse showing sort of the last uh, part of that journey. This was a very exciting time for all of us uh, because everything that we had been working on over the last few years were sort of enclosed in, the, uh, in this uh, truck. Uh, but it's also kind of nerve wracking because all of the, uh, pristine optics were uh, inside the um, inside the vacuum chamber, and we were crossing our fingers for no bumps in the road uh, on the way. Uh, thankfully, everything went uh, really well, uh, and um, uh, the installation uh, went really smoothly. So this is then taking the instrument down to the instrument bay or instrument um, sort of basement where HPF actually lives, and uh, HPF is actually. Uh, fed with an optical fiber. The full 10 meter aperture of the Hobby Ebley telescope is actually focused uh, onto the tip of a 300 micron uh, wide fiber, which is just then about few, uh, a few hair widths in, in diameters. We're really collapsing all of that light gathering power into a, uh, an optical fiber that we then snake down into the basement that we hook up uh, then to the spectrograph. And since we installed it and then in late 2017, early 2018, we have now then been uh, conducting then observations uh, of um, nearby red dwarf stars to detect and characterize uh, planets orbiting um, um, around them. And um, there are resident astronomers that then live on the mountain uh, and telescope operators that work tirelessly uh, then during the night to uh, give us um, exciting new data uh, almost every night when it's clear. And then we're always uh, super excited uh, to take a look and reduce uh, the data the day after to see if we are starting to see uh, further hints of, of uh, any exciting planetary signals. Then I'm very excited to uh, highlight one of the, um, the planet detection that we made. Uh, just This was just actually, uh, we just got accepted just a, a few days ago. Uh, we'll be having press releases out in, in the coming days. Uh, so I'm giving you sort of a sneak peek of, of uh, uh, this new exciting system. But um, we have uh, then uh, detected uh, what is possibly the first uh, exoplanet system that uh, could be capable of creating aurora on the surface of the star. So how, how do you actually do that? So this, um, what I'm showing here is actually the Jupiter IO uh, system. 
uh, but uh, Jupiter and Io, um, uh, the Jupiter Io system is actually capable of creating uh, these auroras. And so Io is the most uh, closest by moon uh, to Jupiter. Io is, has a lot of volcanic activity and is capable of um, spewing out all these charged particles. And these charged particles can actually be caught up in uh, Jupiter's magnetic field as Io orbits around Jupiter. And then these charged particles can actually be hurled, hurled and launched towards uh, Jupiter along the magnetic field lines and as these uh, high energy particles um, and highly charged particles uh, collide with the, the, uh, the surface of Jupiter or the atmosphere of Jupiter, then it is capable of creating this auroral hotspot, which is visible at optical and then also uh, radio wavelengths. And so, then in the system that we have detected, uh, which is called uh, Gliese 1151, uh, where we have discovered a rocky planet using HPF. Uh, it has a mass of around two and a half Earth masses and an orbital period of around two days. This is a very nearby um, star. It's about, it's within eight parsecs. I don't exactly remember how close, uh, six to eight parsecs, uh, if I remember correctly. But uh, we think uh, that that um, that we're really seeing the first evidence here of uh, then um, sort of the star planet interactions where the planet is actually capable of funneling these charged particles uh, towards the the whole star, creating this auroral hotspot. The the sort of the radio detection of the auroral signature was actually announced uh, in Nature just a few months ago last year but uh, it wasn't completely known if there was actually a planet orbiting around it, but there was a hypothesis that, oh, this could potentially be uh, this aur auroral signature that we're seeing in the radio could actually be uh, created by an orbiting planet. So they, um, there was a clear prediction of that there might potentially be a planet orbiting around it. And then with HPF, the star, we had already been observing it with HPF because this is one of the most nearby uh, stars. Um, in the stellar neighborhood. And then we were also very excited to continue to follow it up. And lo and behold, we were able to, to find the planet that was predicted to be there. So we were very excited about that. So stay tuned for some um, uh, press releases that will be coming out in, in the coming days on this. Okay, great. So those were sort of the main things that I wanted to uh, talk about uh, on the uh, spectrograph uh, side. Are there any questions? at this point, or do, do we prefer to wait until the Q&A period later? Uh, we have a few, but I think we'll wait till the Q&A. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. Then great, then let's just dive right into um, the next part of the talk and then on the engineer diffusers. So this is then a technique that we've been using to, um, to improve the uh, transit photometric technique from the ground. Then before we dive into the engineer diffusers, then, uh, uh, then I wanted to mention, whenever I talk uh, about uh, sort of the transit technique, uh, then I always have to mention uh, the Kepler mission. But the Kepler mission was a fantastic uh, spacecraft and mission that uh, was launched in 2009. And the main science goal of Kepler was to stare at a single uh, patch of the night sky uh, for four years. Um, to look for transiting planets, observing then about 150,000 uh, stars uh, in one go, um, observing then um, consistently over a four year time period, and then looking for these minuscule uh, transits um, and find planets that way. Uh, Kepler was extremely good at this, uh, found over um, many thousands of uh, uh, planets and planet candidates and really transformed our understanding of exoplanets and the frequency of exoplanets in, in the Milky Way. The Kepler mission has now uh, ended and uh, there were actually uh, a couple of failures uh, after the primary mission ended. Uh, there was also an extension, uh, which I'm showing over here called K2, uh, which sort of um, allowed Kepler to uh, 
steer and observe uh, certain patches of the, the night sky with um, only two reaction wheels. Normally uh, you need at least three reaction wheels to actually be able to point uh, to the same uh, point in the sky uh, in a stable manner. Unfortunately, uh, two of the reaction wheels failed in Kepler uh, and Kepler has now been decommissioned. But in many ways, the successor of Kepler, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite is now surveying the entire night sky, looking for transiting exoplanets around the, the nearest and brightest stars um, since 2018. And TESS has found uh, over 2000 planetary candidates and uh, many of which have been confirmed, but a number of which still uh, need active ground-based uh, follow-up but especially getting precision ground space transits of these planetary systems or planetary candidates is really critical in further confirming that these potential planet candidates are in, uh, in fact true, true exoplanets. However, when trying to make measurements from the ground, um, Overall, it is it is just difficult because we have to uh, we have to contend with observing um, our stars through through the atmosphere. And here I'm showing a, a little cartoon showing sort of light uh, coming from a distant faraway star uh, passing through different layers of the atmosphere. But as the light passes through, it hits these different layers, which have different temperature profiles, different wind speeds, and so on forth, so on and so forth, which ultimately causes our uh, images of our stars to, to dance around on our detector. This is problematic uh, because ideally we want to try and keep the image of our star to um, illuminate the same sets of pixels if we want to try and get higher precision measurements because our pixels are not perfect. Uh, all of them have intrinsic different sensitivities to the light uh, falling in on them. And this is sort of where engineer diffusers uh, come in. So uh, what are engineer diffusers? These are these uh, optical devices that are capable of uh, molding the image of a star into a broad and stabilized uh, top hat shape. And I'm showing a engineer diffuser over here, and which uh, is this glass uh, substrate that has these uh, intri in, uh, intricate engineered um, patterns on top of it that are capable of sort of spreading the light out in this deterministic manner. And I actually have a diffuser slide uh, with me over here. What I want to try and do now is what I, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and try and give you sort of a live demo of sorts over Zoom and see how that works. I have a diffuser slide uh, over here. You can see uh, the sort of different circles. These are um, different um, than uh, engineer diffuser patterns. And then depending on exactly how you, um, how you uh, engineer uh, the surface structures, then you can uh, get different output patterns. So then I have a laser pointer over here and hopefully you can uh, see this. Uh, and uh, then if we send it through different uh, patterns, then we can get a filled circle, unfilled circle, even a square. Let's see over here, if you can improve this unfilled circle, square, there's a line over here, uh, and even a triangle, and so on and so forth. So depending on exactly how you uh, design these uh, diffusers, you can um, get the different output patterns. Let me go back quickly and share my screen. Can you guys see the screen again? Yep, we see it. Great. And then, yeah, these uh, diffusers uh, are then made with these uh, nanofabrication techniques. If you want to make these carefully uh, engineered uh, structures to make uh, careful uh, different shapes, uh, but then any, there are also many other types of different diffusers. Uh, I mean, a hazy piece of glass can work, a shower curtain and all those types of things. Other diffusers are also used in architectural lighting systems, concert lighting systems, and even in cars car lighting and, and, uh, and in many other different places. But we were very excited to try out this uh, new technology for um, astronomy. So we work with a, a company called RPC Photonics uh, in Rochester in upstate New York. 
uh, which really specialize in making these uh, diffusers. So we work with them to um, make a diffuser that is about 150 uh, millimeter um, in diameter, which I'm showing over here in this figure uh, that we installed on the Arctic uh, imager, which is uh, uh, an imager on the three and a half meter telescope at uh, Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. And using the diffuser, then um, on the three and a half meter telescope, we have been able to obtain some of the highest precision photometry that has ever been achieved uh, from the ground. Here I'm showing uh, some of the engineering data that we took uh, from our paper that we published in 2017, showing here the relative flux as a function of BJD. This is the biocentric Julian date. You can just think about this as a timestamp in days. So this shows then a, a section of um, uh, time uh, when we observed a single star called 16 sig A uh, for about four to five hours. And then the photometric precision that we're achieving is uh, around on the order of 60 parts per million, um, which is within a factor of two of the Kepler spacecraft on the same star. So we're very excited to um, then be sort of approaching space quality photometric positions um, that we can achieve now from the ground. And since uh, we installed the diffuser on the three and a half meter telescope at Apache Point, we have been using it to actively follow up a number of different planetary systems uh, and transits. We have a number of different papers out uh, and in preparation with uh, different collaborators. Here I'm showing an example transit that we observed of this planet called G940b. This is a Neptune uh, sized uh, planet uh, with an orbital period of around six days um, at a distance of about 100 light years or so uh, orbiting a nearby uh, M dwarf. Uh, here I'm showing the transit light curve from Kepler, the Kepler spacecraft. And here I'm showing the light curve that we were obtaining with the diffuser on the three and a half meter telescope at Apache point. And because engineered diffusers are uh, then really allow us to obtain very high precision measurements from the ground. And they're also fairly inexpensive devices. Uh, then diffusers are now being used at a number of different telescopes around the world. Here I'm showing sort of a uh, gallery picture of a few of them showing the three and a half meter telescope at Apache point here, the 200 inch Hale telescope at Palomar Observatory in California, the 10 meter GTC telescope in the Canary Islands. We have some collaborators, we're working with some collaborators there. And uh, excitingly, uh, diffusers also work uh, very nicely on uh, smaller uh, types of telescopes as well. We actually did many of the uh, early tests uh, of um, checking how the diffusers work and things like that on the uh, 24 inch telescope at, uh, that we have on top of the roof of uh, at Penn State um, where I was doing my PhD, uh, which is called the Davy Lab telescope over here. And uh, that was actually super useful. And we uh, uh, obtained some very high precision measurements even on the 0.6 meter telescope. And we even used it and tested it out on, on smaller telescopes as well. And, um, and like I mentioned, engineered diffusers are relatively inexpensive. Uh, they're not free either. I mean, they're about a two by two inch uh, diffuser uh, is about uh, five to six hundred dollars, and you can buy it off the shelf uh, from RPC Photonics. And um, I wanted to highlight a very uh, a great article that um, a, a friend and collaborator uh, of mine, uh, this is a very serious uh, amateur astronomer, uh, Jerry Hubble. He's the director of Mark Slade Observatory in uh, Virginia. Uh, so he wrote up a very nice article about um, using engineered diffusers to do transit observations uh, with uh, sort of smaller type telescopes um, in the astronomy magazine uh, last year in June. So if you have any questions about uh, using diffusers or trying them out, don't hesitate to, to ask. I'm always happy to, to answer questions. So, and I, I would also recommend uh, taking a look at uh, Jerry's, um, Jerry's great article on that. This may be somewhat related. I'm just going to pop this one in here. Yep. Um, what is a cryo getter? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, if I heard that correctly. 
Yep. So maybe I can go quickly to the the. Yes, here. And then, and then another one related, sort of, what does a diffuser actually do? So why don't you just stick with those first, and then we'll go back to some other ones. Yep, great. So a cryogetter, that's a great uh, question. So that is uh, essentially charcoal. Uh, so that is cooled uh, down to uh, liquid nitrogen uh, temperatures. So you can see here, this is the liquid nitrogen tank. And then we have, um, there is actually a cover on top of here, but there are, uh, under this cover, there are lots of different pockets and where we have uh, sprinkled in um, then charcoal, uh, which is literally just uh, um, a charcoal. We only use the finest uh, coconut charcoal from Indonesia, or I don't know exactly where it's from, but, uh, uh, but, um, but it turns out if you cool uh, charcoal to uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures, they become extremely efficient um, machines to sort of um, catch gas and become uh, then essentially vacuum pumps. And um, they work so that uh, if a, a gas particle actually hits uh, the charcoal, it actually just, uh, when it's that cold, it just sort of ca uh, holds onto it and it catches uh, it and uh, doesn't allow it to uh, move around uh, anymore. So this then is a very efficient way to um, uh, help us get a high quality vacuum uh, long term. And this is because uh, charcoal has then uh, this uh, extremely, I mean, it's square, I don't know exactly how many um, square miles uh, it has in surface uh, area, but it's uh, extremely high. And uh, then an extremely good way to allow us to maintain high quality vacuum long term. So excellent question. And then the other question was around uh, diffusers. What was it? What does the diffuser actually do? Okay, yeah, so let's see. Uh, I can go back here to the diffuser image. So yeah, so the diffuser is then just a way to, um, it's just this um, piece of glass uh, that has a thin polymer uh, layer on top of it. And uh, depending on exactly how you uh, craft and um, engineer the surface structures, you can deflect uh, and uh, steer the light into uh, different locations on, on the output beam path in a very stable manner. And uh, it then spreads the light out over many pixels and um, in a very stable manner. So by doing this, then we can um, really uh, stabilize our images of our star and then really improve our photometric positions. Uh, I don't know if any of you actually have tried doing uh, uh, transit observations uh, with any telescopes. Another trick that is often uh, done to sort of um, get higher precision photometric measurements is by defocusing the telescope. Uh, if you're taking repeated images during a transit because then you're starting to spread the light out over many detector pixels. Uh, this is in some ways is a, a way to defocus the telescope without defocusing it. But the, the main, um, improvement here that we get from um, using a diffuser instead of defocusing it is that it keeps the um, both the image to be very broad, allowing us to average over any sort of interpixel sensitivity effects, but it also keeps the, the image of the star extremely stable. And that is an important uh, part of uh, further improving the precision levels that we can get. Uh, because even if we defocus the, the telescope, any sort of um, optical aberrations start to kick in as soon as you uh, start to uh, defocus and you, um, the image of the star still sort of uh, wanders around and um, sort of you can get all these different uh, peaks and things like that that are detrimental to the, the photometric precision that you can ultimately get. But yeah, great question. Awesome, let's see, so. I think that is it on the diffusers. And then uh, the last part of uh, the talk, then I just wanted to um, say a few words about um, uh, sort of future missions. But um, we yeah, are living at, at uh, very exciting times in, in exoplanet science when there are lots of uh, different exoplanet missions going on, uh, both on the ground and also in space. Uh, some very exciting ones coming up. Uh, uh, here is then sort of a, a, a gallery of a few different uh, past, current, and future exoplanet missions, both from NASA and, the, and from ESA, the European Space Agency. Uh, 
showing here Hubble and then Kepler that I mentioned. Spitzer was also a fantastic um, space-based telescope uh, observing in the, the infrared. Um, tests over here that I mentioned, uh, which is currently just actually finished its primary mission um, and is currently going strong, um, uh, trying to find further planets as part of its extended mission. And KEOPS is another space-based telescope that also uses the transit method to detect um, transiting exoplanets and was just uh, launched recently and is starting to, um, we're starting to see some very exciting um, discoveries with, with KEOPS. And now we're really starting to become very excited for the launch of uh, the James Webb Space Telescope um, or JWST, which uh, is hopefully going to be launched in, in the coming months, fingers crossed. Uh, and James Webb is going to be sort of really going to revolutionize our capability to do to study exoplanet atmospheres. So uh, the exoplanet science community is really excited for the the launch of James Webb. And but then we can actually take very high precision measurements of the or or spectra of the the atmospheres of the planet as it transits in front of the host um, star. And then we can get spectra of the, the atmospheres of the planet. And then we can start to ask very exciting questions. Um, can, are we potentially seeing water, methane, ozone, or other uh, indicators that could potentially be so-called biomarkers on where you can start to get a handle of uh, if there are any sort of biotic pro processes that are creating those. We already with uh, current instruments like Hubble, and then we've seen um, and discovered water on some exoplanets already, uh, but we still have yet to uh, detect a number of different biomarkers at the same time, like water, methane and, and those which would further sort of indicate if there might potentially be biotic processes creating them. And then, yeah, that was sort of uh, at the end of the talk, I just want to show you a quick time lapse sort of one of uh, when we were working on HPF at McDonald Observatory. This is actually when we were threading in the optical fiber uh, into the instrument. The optical fiber actually comes uh, down over here through um, uh, this holder over here goes through a vacuum feed through through the multilayer insulation blankets that we have through the thermal shield and then we put it in uh, carefully in a tube and then the that we carefully placed in the right place so that then the light can then bounce between the different mirrors hits the shell grating which is over here that I showed you before and then bounces around and ultimately lands on our imager over here. And yeah, we're excited to continue observing with HPF and we're actively uh, wrapping up uh, the installation and commissioning of NUIT. And so stay tuned for um, some further exciting uh, planet discoveries coming up. So thank you so much. Happy to take any questions. Uh, one related to the image you're showing now, um, I think there was a question was, what was the uh, insulator material made of? Oh, uh, from the multilayer insulation blankets, you mean? Yeah, I think that's what it was related to. It came in about that time. Yeah, so uh, if, what we use there is then a, a luminized mylar. Uh, it's similar to um, what we uh, used in the um, uh, uh, helium balloons, actually. And um, this is also the same uh, material that uh, NASA uses for uh, their multilayer insulation blankets for uh, spacecraft and things like that. Uh, then we use um, then a spacer material. Um, we actually just use uh, bridal veil, actually, full yeah. uh, bridal veil, which we, um, uh, so it was an, a funny time when we uh, then had to order uh, all of this bridal veil for our, uh, for our uh, project. And, but it works really well. And uh, we then stack uh, and alternate these um, materials to create these different la layers because uh, we have to have this uh, sort of bridal well spacer material to make sure that the aluminized uh, mylar doesn't short uh, out. Uh, so then we use the spacer material and then we have about 12 uh, layers to 24 layers, depending on 
how uh, much thermal insulation that we that we need. So yeah, great question. Uh, we have one that came in fairly early back, I think when you were talking about red dwarfs. <clears throat> the question is, people commonly speak of the high energy volatility of red dwarfs mm -hmm. when discussing life around uh, the red dwarf. Um, however, does this, how, I got, I'm assuming how long does this period last? And uh, how long after its formation does the red dwarf calm down? Yeah, so that is a great, uh, really great question. So uh, M dwarfs actually, we're actually still uh, trying to really understand what sort of is the nature of M dwarfs. They have generally been somewhat poorly studied from the fact that they are just so dim on most of the highest position um, instruments have uh, in the past have been up, uh, operating in the optical. So we're really sort of, uh, even today, starting to understand the properties of uh, M-dwarfs uh, better. But it's ex exactly right, uh, M-dwarfs uh, spend a considerable amount of time in a very active uh, phase. Um, still, some of them um, remain active for most of their lives, actually, and we're still trying to figure out exactly how long, because that has direct bearing uh, on sort of habitability considerations. Many of them flare like these soup, have these super or mega flares. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of those uh, sort of news reports uh, out there on those, uh, which, I mean, that would be very detrimental uh, for life. And um, so, but some of them um, are not as flaring. And um, um, so then the hope is then that we might be able to um, I guess understand them better um, as we continue to 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 study them, and to uh, sort of think through a bit more how flaring impacts sort of habitability questions and considerations. There's one related to the fiber optic, um, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming if I don't get this right, hopefully um, it'll make sense. Anyways. How does small optical fiber lead image of 10 meter telescope? I'm assuming it seems like it, how do you focus it down? Apparently is what they're asking. Yeah, so then you just have to, uh, the full, um, um, then you just have to have a very good uh, sort of uh, optics in your uh, big telescope. And then uh, the size of the, the fiber that we use is sort of matched to, uh, get about um, mass to the seeing, uh, which is sort of the uh, off uh, at the observatory, um, which is about the median seeing there. Uh, seeing is then just the sort of the average size of the, the star uh, at the observatory um, in terms of angle. Usually it's uh, at McDonald Observatory, the median seeing is around one, 1.3 or so. So we have sized our, um, our fiber to be 1.3 arc seconds on the sky. And um, that is then about the, the 300 micron uh, size of the fiber. And then, yeah, the main thing is just to make sure that uh, your optics in your telescope are good and that they are aligned properly. Uh, you have to always spend time at the beginning of the night, especially as the sort of, you're starting to get the telescope ready uh, to uh, phase up all of the different, um, Telescope segments. The Hoppy Ebley telescope is a segmented telescope uh, that has, uh, I believe, 92 segments, uh, one meter sort of hexagons. And then at the beginning of the night, especially when uh, things are sort of thermalizing uh, in the sort of desert um, mountain weather of McDonald Observatory, then you have to uh, spend a few minutes at the beginning of the night to make sure that all of the different telescope segments sort of uh, align up uh, together. And then you have all of these pistons uh, to make sure that they focus all of the light into, into the fiber. Yeah, we have a couple of questions I, uh, also that came in on the chat about biomarkers. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any uh, spectral emissions or radio emissions or things that look like artificial light that could be indications for um, uh, life on other planets? Yeah, so that is a, a great question. So um, and, uh, consideration that uh, uh, a number of different uh, sort of teams are considering, there is um, the possibility that you might be able to find sort of um, 
the search for extraterrestrial life or SETI uh, through uh, by finding sort of um, laser emission uh, at uh, sort of very localized um, wavelengths by taking high resolution spectra of um, of these different stars. So that's one way to try and find them. Uh, and uh, I know some um, some people are working on, and I've seen some papers on. And then another one is uh, the radio, and there is a number of different teams uh, sort of actively uh, looking at a sort of potential radio signatures um, with with respect to sort of SETI work. Uh, there's a breakthrough listen uh, um, sort of big project that is being spearheaded actually by uh, then uh, uh, a collaboration institution is at Penn State and then also at Berkeley and, and many other places using the very large array and green bank radio telescopes and a number of different other uh, radio facilities to, to look for that. Uh, will any future missions be able to measure nanosecond light pulses? That is a great question. Um, I I know that the radio telescopes have uh, like super fine time resolutions that they can find like these different pulses, and but I'm not completely sure on the optical end uh, in terms of the sort of the the cadence that you you can get. Uh, there on that front, uh, but in the radio certainly you can uh, get some very high uh, cadence um, cadence observations there. Maybe I could slip in a, a question here um, mm -hmm. with the two new types of instruments that you've been describing uh, in the second half of your talk. Um, is it the plan to do follow up uh, observations of planet uh, exoplanet candidates that have been identified by Kepler and others, or are you guys doing de novo analysis of nearby stars, just sort of cold research uh, without, without knowing anything in advance? What's, what's the general idea? Yeah, so that's a great question. So we, uh, uh, in short, we're sort of doing a little bit of both. Uh, so we have uh, a guaranteed time allocation to do the so-called, for HPF, it's called the HPF survey, which is then a blind search of uh, then uh, nearby M dwarfs within 25 parsecs. And then we have uh, a guaranteed set uh, number of hours and nights to um, solely uh, do that, to sort of blindly search for planets uh, with the radio velocity method. But then we also have uh, additional time to um, look for transiting exoplanets uh, or measure the masses using HPF and uh, now know it uh, soon in the future uh, to measure the masses of transiting exoplanets. The, the, the nice thing about uh, observing, um, if you know that a planet is transiting, then you actually know that there's a signal there, you know the period, uh, which makes things um, often a lot easier uh, because if you're doing a blind search, then you're often sort of wondering okay, what is the periodicity of the signal there? Is it true? And then you often have to sort of, um, to convince yourself that it's actually a really a true signal, then you have to often get a lot more observations to, to convince yourselves that, uh, that the signal is indeed highly significant. Um, when you were talking earlier about uh, detection methods, um, mm -hmm. I mean, they're both fairly simple to understand, but in practice, I imagine the precision necessary is incredibly challenging. But when you consider that uh, you're looking at systems like TRAPPIST where there are multiple planets, or how, how that seems like an impossible situation. How can you tease data out of that complicated a signal? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, especially like with the radio velocity method, because then you're measuring uh, sort of how the, the star is shifting around. And then if you have at least seven planets that are tugging the, the star uh, to and fro, then that becomes extremely uh, difficult to disentangle very quickly. And so with, um, with the radio velocity method, then, uh, then you need a lot of observations to, to do that. And, and so currently we, that is very difficult to do, especially for uh, the TRAPPIST system, because it's uh, a combination of uh, slightly faint uh, for uh, a number of um, a number of spectrographs, but it's actually very well matched uh, to the precision of uh, or the wavelength coverage of HPF, because HPF is observing in the near infrared. But even with HPF, it's extremely challenging. 
And uh, we also have some other collaborators collaborators uh, on that have another near infrared instrument uh, at the Subaru telescope, which we are actually uh, working with to um, to publish a paper on uh, some uh, untrappist one uh, result, which will be coming out soon. But that's a great question. So that is with the radio velocity method. With the transient method, then things are a bit easier uh, because then. Uh, especially if you're observing with Kepler or tests, then it just sort of is staring there and taking measurements every half an hour or 10 minutes or two minutes. And then you just sort of, you can see the transits coming in. And even if two transits, actually sometimes the, the, the Trappist um, one planets uh, transit both two planets at the same time. And then you can even then you can uh, still sort of uh, make out uh, what is happening because um, I figure out what is happening uh, with the transit method because then you would get one dip and then you would get another dip that sort of would uh, make it an overall bigger dip uh, depending on exactly when it happens. So with the transit method is a bit bit easier to disentangle, but with the RV method, then yeah, it very quickly becomes um, so sort of very complicated to to figure out what is happening. Okay, so we're going to be talking about uh, Johannes Kepler, Parallax, and the astronomical unit. And let me get this working. Oops. So the topics we're going to cover tonight in this little talk is the geocentric versus the heliocentric universe, Kepler's laws, parallax, and the astronomical unit. This is all going to tie together at the end, I hope. So starting with the geocentric universe, this was the belief since the time of Aristotle that the Earth was the center of the universe and everything went around the Earth in a perfect circle. You know, starting with the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, and the known planets of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, and Mercury. And the people who supported the big supporters were the ancient Greeks and the Catholic Church. And then there was this big discussion going on, which got Galileo in trouble about the sun being in the center of the universe. And that was instead of the Earth being in the center, everything revolved around the sun, again in perfect circles, with the exception of the moon, which obviously went around the Earth. And the supporters there were Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo. So let's talk a little bit about Kepler's laws of planetary motion. They were based on the observations of the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, and Kepler was one of Tycho's assistants who helped him with the creation of a new star catalog called the Rudolphine Tables. And Tycho unexpectedly died in 1601. The good part about this was that Kepler was able to use Tycho's observations to formulate his laws of planetary motion. Tycho's observations were amongst the most accurate in the existence at the time that the data was collected. So we started with a big set of data. And the first law that Kepler came up with almost eight years after Tycho died was that planets moved in an ellipse rather than a circle around the sun. And the sun is at the, one of the foci of the, of the ellipse. And one of the things we're going to be talking about in our ellipse is egg shape. So we have a long axis and a short axis. We're going to be talking about the semi-major axis, which is half of the long axis. The second law, also published in 1609, is that a line segment joining a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. So this is what it kind of looks like in real life. And these two blue areas are really the same. But I don't know if you can really see it. So I think this diagram here to the right shows it a little bit better. So that gets us to the second law. And here's where things start to get interesting. Uh, the third law of planetary motion, which says the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis. And this was published 10 years after the first two laws. And what's interesting about this is it finally gave us a way to 
know the relative distances from the sun to each of the planets. So what you have in the first column is the observed period in days, and I converted this into fractional years. And then what I did to check to see how accurate the data is, which is the data that Kepler used, was I did the math and I took the radius cube divided by the time squared. And you can see the results are actually pretty good considering they were doing plain visual astronomy when they were collecting this data. So basically uh, from uh, Kepler's laws, we got from a situation where everything was going around the sun in perfect circles to things moving around the sun in ellipses and this red circle here, the orbit of Mars is, probably, is one of the most elliptical orbits in the solar system. And that was really the thing that got Kepler wondering whether or not there was, they were tra planets traveled around the sun in circles. So that gets us into the topic of parallax. Edmund Halley proposed that we could uh, use the upcoming Venus transits to measure the distance to the sun. What's unique about Venus transits is they occur in pairs about eight years apart. So hopefully everyone got a chance to see one or both of the transits a few years ago. And that uh, the time from the last transit in a pair to the next pair is over a hundred years. So this means if you're doing it and you're doing it with the transit, you basically have two shots at it, eight years apart. And it also turns out that if you are widely separated on the surface of the earth, the time that Venus touches the sun's limb, the edge, varies, and this is due to parallax. And when Halley proposed this back in 1716, the next two pairs were, the next pair was coming up in 1761, and 1769, and Halley knew he was not going to be around to see the results of this, but he pushed for this to happen. So if we were in painted hall, I would probably tell you now, stick out your hand, close one eye, close the other eye, and watch your thumb move against the background. So since I can't do that, I'm going to show this simple diagram about what parallax is, and it's basically depending on where you stand, the background changes. So if you're standing at point A, the star in the center appears to be against the blue background. But if you're looking from point B, it appears to be from the behind in the red background. And that's all it is, a shift of the star, an object's position due to the change in your viewpoint. So with that in mind, this is a, dot to scale diagram, the angle of parallax is this angle here in the triangle. It's a very, very, very small angle. So if you're down at the Earth, at the South Pole, you would see Venus near the North Pole and vice versa. So you basically have a geometry problem. You know what the distance is between the two observers and you know alpha, the angle of parallax, so you can figure out the using trigonometry. So to do this, you have to observe Venus when it first enters the sun's limb, which is point B, and when it exits the sun's limb, which is point C. And what happens because you're in two different locations on the earth, the path is different uh, depending on where you are. One path will be longer than the other and one will be shorter. And based on that information, you can calculate this angle alpha. So, what, so the point where Venus touches the limb for the first time is called second contact, much like uh, eclipse. And here I am at the 2012 uh, eclipse in peak and back here is a projection of the sun with Venus there, and what we're seeing is a close-up of second contact. And here are three pictures I took within a few seconds of one another, and you can see it's not exactly easy to figure out exactly when uh, Venus 
is just touching the edge of the sun. So that makes the timing exercise very, very difficult. And that was one of the things that made this method of using Venus transits difficult to do in practice. But they did get results which were published in 1771 and it turned out to be 8.6 arc seconds, which is a very, very small angle as I think most of us in the, most of us astronomers know, and I included this table of historical estimates of what the angle of parallax is. And this 8.6 value, which they published in 1771, is uh, really close to the modern values. So, maybe, well, actually, before I do that, based on that, knowing the angle of parallax, we were able to calculate the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which we know is about 93 million miles. And then we can go back to these distances here and multiply all these numbers by 93 million miles, and you would wind up with the actual distances relative to the, uh, as opposed to relative distances. So if you want to learn more about the efforts to measure the Venus transit, uh, the, uh, the distance to the sun, I suggest reading this book, Chasing Venus, Venus by Andrea Wolf. And there's also one of our uh, members of the Astronomy Club published an article back in January of 2007 in Sky and Telescope, which takes figuring out the astronomical unit uh, in a different direction. Outstanding. Thank you, Ira. I guess, um, I don't know if anybody wants to do a question, a quick question. That was totally impressive. I think it's really <laughs> great to get the historical perspective and just think about the precision of the measurements from what you described from the 16 and 1700s and compare that to the talk we just had about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, the, the, the germ of this talk actually took place when I was at the transit and I was thinking about this as like, oh, the astronomical unit. Oh, Kepler. It does seem to be a great story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Very great story. Thank you, Ira. Any any quick questions? We we got time. Any thoughts? Yeah. The actual uh, parallax sighted is the is half the true parallax of the Earth. Right. Uh, 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 and what it boils down to is that if you are sitting on the sun, how big does the Earth look? The Earth looks about sixteen or seventeen arc seconds wide. In other words, just a little speck. And I compare it to uh, what you might think a gnat would look like a couple of yards away if you're sitting in your backyard and you're the, pretending you're the sun uh, and a gnat is a, about two, two yards or so away. That's how big the earth looks from the sun. So that's, that's uh, <laughs> another way to look at that is that uh, the, the sun can light up more than two billion earths at once. Uh, 2.2 uh, billion Earths at once, uh, a tremendous amount of power there. And we're starting to use a little bit of that power in our daily lives. But uh, imagine if we could capture more of it than that, uh, we'd be, we'd be uh, in really good shape. So anyway, that, that's all I had. Also that. think about how much harder it would be if we were around a red dwarf where the diameter of oh. the red dwarf is so much smaller. But then yeah, but, we, but we would be closer, Rex, so it might, <laughs> it might work out. <laughs> might work out, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ira. That was cool. That was that was a lot of fun. Thank you.